This is the Bulldog, Eric Dieters on Real Talk 1160. Ready to de- deliver some radio superbity for you. I have diligently worked on my newsletter and blog, which will be posted around 9 a.m. as it is every morning. Uh, you know, you have to begin every show and every newsletter and blog with, okay, what's going on locally? What's going on in the world? But at the same time, there's always something new that pops up. Uh, sometimes on the way in here, I will think of something that uh, I want to discuss and which is very relevant. And I'm going to pick up where I dropped, uh, left off yesterday a little bit with some of my ranting. But I also want to just uh, honor somebody. I want to honor somebody to start off the show that I've never met before. Never met them, don't know them. Don't know any of their family members. Of course, I'm sure it's a small world that if I engage in some dialogue uh, with one of them, that I will, in fact, know them. But as I was reading the Enquirer this morning, and I was reading the obituaries, one of the obituaries caught my eye. And that obituary was of a young woman by the name of Robin Stevenson. Now, it caught my eye, first off, because she was a beautiful 42-year-old woman. They had her picture up, and and of course, that captures you when you're looking through the obituaries and you see what you hope, elderly faces, and then when you see, every time I see a young face, I look for their names to see if I know who they are, but if it's a young person, I always check out the obituary because I wonder, okay, how, how could this person have died? But here's this beautiful person. Her name is Robin Stevenson, 42, and I read that she passed away on Valentine's Day. She was a sixth grade teacher at Connor Middle School. She has a husband, two children, had a mom and dad, brother, sister, and other relatives. And then there's what I catches my eye and why I'm talking about it. The memorials, the good old American Cancer Society. So I have to assume that this wonderful woman, sixth grade school teacher, daughter, sister, mom, wife, died of cancer. And I just think to myself, God, cancer sucks. And I just want to just send out the best to her family. May God bless her family and her community. I didn't know her. I don't know them, but I know cancer, and it is an insidious, insidious disease. And every time I have a conversation with somebody about cancer, I just tell them, you know, cancer sucks, and they agree. I keep wanting to make bumper stickers up that says, cancer sucks. And, you know, I just haven't taken the time to do it because I think that sums it all up. But uh, God bless Robin Stevenson and her family, her mother, her husband, her kids brother and sister, just incredible. So I hate to begin the show on a downer, but that obituary moved me. And uh, I'm going to give her oracle status posthumously. Quote of the day, I would rather to be exposed to the inconveniences attending too much liberty than those attending too small a degree of it. If you've noticed the theme of my quote of the day about liberty, it's because in my giant favorite quote book that I have, there is a large section of liberty. And I basically, I go through there and I highlight them and I say, Sarah, you know, just use the highlighted quotes. I want to stress this to everybody. I put together the blog and newsletter myself. We pull the quote of the day I pick. Uh, the day in history we just take from the Enquirer. I give them credit for that. Famous birthdays we pull off of a website. I choose Shakespeare. There is a website that uh, tells you the military deaths. We, of course, are proud to report there's no military deaths. Feel good song, I choose that. Three-day forecast we pull off the website. Today it's rainy, Friday cloudy, Saturday mostly sunny. I choose the history story. I choose the joke. I choose the Shakespeare. I let Sarah choose the word of the day. And I also choose the dog saying of the day. 
Winston Churchill is where we get the dog saying of the day. The nose of the bulldog has been slanted backwards so that he can breathe without letting go. How do you like that? Wow. Is that great? Is that great? Pretty tough bulldog right there. You're darn right it is. Um, I tell you right now, I'm getting, uh, I think it's because I'm doing my show solo that I'm getting back into the groove of my, what people really enjoy, a lot of my long diatribes and rants, although I try to do calm rants. I've been told uh, by some of my constructive critics, these are people that look out for me, that they enjoy in my conversational tone, and then when I raise the elevate my voice, it has more effect when I do it less often. Would you agree with that? Yes. You'd agree with that? Less is more. Less is more. Um, how much time do we have till the next break? Oh, we've got at least five minutes. All right, then I'm going to begin the show with this because I have time to do it. You me- remember yesterday I talked about Patrick Henry and his liberty and his, uh, his fight for the Bill of Rights. And then I talked about the infringement upon the liberty and Obama's budget and why he thinks he can get away with it. I want to pick up where I left off. What does it say about Obama's donors that he has, uh, based on the job he has done, well, what does that say? I'll, I'll tell you, it's for two reasons. One, those who give for influence and those who give for the cause they believe in. In other words... Obama has done such a terrible job. Those that are given to Barack Obama are either A, doing it for political influence, which is bad for our country, or two, they're doing it because they believe in the path that he has chosen for America. $1.3 trillion budget deficit submitted. And, uh, you know, Virgil says fortune favors the bold. And, you know, sometimes the bold you know, can have fortune shine upon them. Sometimes not, I suppose. But uh, I am completely serious about calling for an armed revolution in this country. I am completely serious. This is not radio fanfare. It is the truth. And I do so in the spirit of Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson. Is Barack Obama, those of you that study history, I ask you to ask, a, answer this question. Is Barack Obama less a tyrant than George III? <laughs> He's far worse, ladies and gentlemen. He's far worse. Do we in this country have a right to assemble? Yes. Do we have a right to bear arms? Yes. Oh, by the way, this is funny. All those people that you, when you hate somebody politically and you, you, you play the Hitler card, it always kicks you in the butt. I'm looking forward to the person who tries to uh, hit me, TC. You compared him to George the <laughs> Third. Isn't that great? George the Third. In other words, have to Google him. To in find other out. words, in other words, I'm not comparing our president to Hitler, folks. I'm saying he's worse than George III. Do we have a right to bear arms in this country? Yes. Do we have the right to free speech? Yes. It is the height of hypocrisy, and I wrote this down last night, or yesterday on the way home from my show, and I thought, oh my God, this is awesome. It is the height of hypocrisy for Obama and our political leaders to support armed revolt. Ladies and gentlemen, do do you not get this? They have supported Hillary, Barack, Democrats, Republicans. They have supported armed revolt. Not right. Afghanistan, Libya, Egypt, Iran, Syria. When in fact, nothing in those countries comes close to a threat to our country as the threat of Barack Obama in the White House. It's not even close, folks. It's not even close. Do those countries double the debt of the United States of America? No. Do those countries submit $1.3 trillion deficit budgets? No. Do those countries 
have anything to do with guarding our border? No. Did those countries have anything to do with our economic prosperity except oil, to which our president does not want us to be independent? No. When I come back, I'm going to pick up from where I left off, and it's only going to get better. I am saying what no one else in the country is saying. It's time for an armed, yes, an armed revolution on Real Talk 1160. The Simon Kenton Pioneers wrap up their regular season tonight at Henry County. Pre-game coverage starts at 7 with Steve Jarnicky. Tip-off at 7.30 on Christian Talk 1050. And now back to the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. This is Eric Dieters, the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160, saying what nobody else in the country's got the guts to say. <laughs> Me and Michael Savage, baby. Bulldog Nation, Savage Nation. Savage. I, I agree 100% about... Uh, how did end liberalism is let's breed crossbreed conservatives with liberals. Hey, uh, by the way, this is an interesting um, observation about the liberals and uh, occupiers and all that. I think to myself, you know what? I am calling for conservatives and libertarians to pick up guns and march on Washington. And they, the liberals, it's funny, like the whole 1960s, they all wanted to gather. They wanted to do all their protests and everything else. It's going to be interesting to see what the liberals take on my ideas of a protest is. Now, let me continue. Here's my idea. We should gather in Washington with guns and demand the peaceful resignation and departure of the presidency, of the, from the presidency of Barack Obama. I want to stress this, okay? The peaceful resignation resignation and departure of Barack Obama. Can you imagine if there was 50,000 or 100,000 people with guns that descended upon Washington, D.C. and demanded Barack Obama's resignation? Now, I want to show you the hypocrisy of this, okay? There's a lot of hypocrisy because I find it amusing that these political leaders that I want to force out of office through force they love it when there is force being thrown at people they consider tyrants in these other countries that have absolutely nothing to do with our national security. Now, for those of you that claim we have peaceful process here, I respond with poppycock, one of my favorite words. The corruption of the electoral process by corrupt money has rendered the ballot a sham. It's a sham in this country. All right. Newt Gingrich's ideas were leading the day. But the money of Romney caused everybody in Iowa to say, oh, I'll change my mind about him. Now it's going to be interesting to see Romney's corrupt money can change the mind of everybody in Michigan who at the moment wants to vote for Rick Santorum. And there's a poll, there's a poll that has him 12 points up nationally. All right? In addition, we can't afford to wait for the next ballot. The president's going to continue to increase our debt and regulate our economy in oblivion. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, the American jury. One thing that I know as a lawyer is I know how it works. Do you realize that every time Congress passes one of these acts, the Dodd-Frank Act, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, Obamacare, that the departments, the health departments, and this Sibelius, we ought, to, we ought to jack wagon her up. You know, Gilligan, her daddy, her daddy was a governor of Ohio. Boy, she strayed from her Midwest roots. Yeah, she went to Kansas. What did she learn how to be? More liberal. You know what? They're allowed, these departments are allowed without any electoral oversight, without any, con they enact regulations, Tons of them. See what happened? They call it an enabling bill. And then those departments just enact and act and act and act and act and act and act. So if you think Congress is the only uh, body that passes law, are you kidding me? Are you that stupid? The state of Ohio, the state of Kentucky, the state of Indiana, every state in the country, each state's department, each of those states, their individual departments, they pass regulation, 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 regulation. I'm sorry. I've had enough. 
I'm not going to wait a year. Why should we wait? Furthermore, guess what? Here's some more hypocrisy. You know what? I challenge anybody. I challenge anybody. You know what? If you're a congressman or you're a senator or you think you're some big, hot shot, smart person, bring it on. Let's debate. Name the place. Name the public forum. Name the podium. I, I throw out, I've been throwing out this challenge for five years. No one takes me up on it. I would whoop their ass. Let me tell you something about the hypocrisy of, of, of Congress, about not wanting to wait. Barack Obama says to us, if Congress doesn't act, I'm not going to wait. Huh. So the president wants to ignore the Constitution and act without Congress. Well, I say we the people don't need to wait on him. Right, Mr. President? Stick it right up his colon. His own words. His own logic. And by the way, yes, people have said this. It makes T.C. nervous, I know. When there are guns and there's a crowd, there might be violence and death. You know what I say? So what? Is not the cause of saving America... Worth dying for, no less honorable than dying for her in her defense. I say it's honorable. What I am saying, ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, is Barack Obama is a traitor to America. I, I can go down the laundry list of things that Barack Obama has done and is doing, which proves he's a traitor to America. It is impossible for any common sense, normal human being to look at Barack Obama's administration where he's doubled the debt, trying to triple the debt, submits a budget of $1.3 trillion deficit, does nothing to deal with the deficit, does nothing to deal with the debt, and sits back and says, he's got America's best interest at heart. Yes, he does. <laughs> and those who support this including Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and I got a little present for her today, are also traitors to America. And let me tell you, yesterday I focused on the lack of responsibility that I see everywhere from people. I mean, here, here's the sense of entitlement that people have now. There are people that think they're entitled to free legal advice. I get these, I get these constant requests, emails, every single day, and I respond to every single one of them. I say, yeah, here's advice. I give free advice all day long. And then I'll get an email from somebody who wants me to take their case, which means like file a lawsuit or something for them. And it's a loser of a case. And I say, I can't do that, you know, for X, Y, Z. They get mad at me because I won't do it. And this one, her name is Barbie. I'm going to call her last name Barbie Shoecart. Facebook friend, Barbie Shoecart, wanted me to sue her landlord for all these problems in her apartment. And I said, I don't take those cases. And I says, furthermore, is that a Lanny Holbrook apartment? She said, yeah. I said, well, he died, and there's a bunch of financial problems, and I'll never collect any money for you anyway. It's a lost cause. Oh, so you're saying you only take cases where you can make money? I said, no, I only take cases where I can do some good. And I said, I'm not going to let you make me feel guilty. Well, why are you feeling guilty? I said, you're not listening to me, Barbie. I'm not feeling guilty. This woman, Barbie the shoe cart, thinks that I'm supposed to do free legal work for a lost cause. The entitlement. I'll guarantee you she's on some government assistance. Aren't you, Barbie? <laughs> it's incredible. And there are cowards everywhere. There's cowards in the news, there's cowards in talk radio, there's cowards on cable news, cowards, cowards, cowards. You know why? They're concerned with advertising dollars or the interview that they can land. It's awesome when you don't give a damn about landing an interview. It's awesome and empowering to speak the truth. It's awesome. I've had enough. The Republican establishment is corrupt. The Democrat establishment is corrupt. Barack Obama is a traitor to America. They all got to go, and I want them to all go now. They want us to all be timid sheep. That's what they want. They want us to be little 
as I coined that phrase, sheep for shepherds who are fools. They fear lions. <laughs> Boy, do they fear lions. I'll guarantee you they would fear lions with guns. We could change America, folks, if we had enough courageous people to pack their guns. And by the way, we're not going to get a permit from the bureaucracy of the Park Service. you got to have a permit to assemble. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Watch us. We're going to assemble. <laughs> oh, my God. It's incredible. And, and based upon the responses that I got yesterday, there's plenty of people ready to join me. It's pretty cool. There's plenty of people ready to join me. I did get, this is funny, TC, and on a light note before the break, I did get a complaint from a mother, God lover, uh -oh. who didn't like the cosmetic talk with Dr. Uh, Kurtzman from the standpoint of how young girls feel about their bodies and they have to be perfect. And yeah. that's what cosm you know, cosmetics are. Well, I, I don't think that's true. I think Dr. Kurtzman is a tool. He's an instrument that if you want to improve your look, he's available to you. Right. You don't yeah. have to do it. Right. Anyway, when we come back, by the way, if you want to call me, 513-579-1160. It's your fault you don't remind me. 513-579-1160 is the number. I'm ready to take on anybody on Real Talk 1160. Eric Dieter's the bulldog on Real Talk 1160. All I want to be in life's a cowboy. A man's man and a woman's man. Bulldog Nation. Let's weed out all the wimps. Don't need any wimps in Bulldog Nation. Today in history, 1862, the Battle of Fort Donelson in Tennessee ended up, ended as some 12,000 Confederate troops surrendered, earning the victorious Union General Ulysses S. Grant the nickname Unconditional Surrender Grant, who, by the way, never lost a battle. Never. He had a draw or two, never lost a battle. Famous birthdays, Ice T and Sonny Bono. I got you, babe. How about this history story? In the fall of 1945, a burly federal marshal named Fred Canville paid a visit to a federal prison in El Reno, Oklahoma. I love, don't you love my history stories because you've never heard these before. As he was talking to Warden L. Clark Shilder, a sign on the warden's desk caught his attention. Canfield made an admiring comment about the sign and mentioned that he thought a friend of his would just love it. No problem, said the warden. The head of the prison's paint shop had designed the sign. It would be easy enough to have him run up another. Warden Shilder promised to send the duplicate sign to Canville as soon as possible, and he was good as his word. Fred Canville was a lifelong political hack once described by an associate is loud mouth, profane, vulgar, and uncouth. My kind of guy. But on this day, he made a contribution to popular culture and presidential lore that will live forever. Canville's longtime friend was a fellow Missourian, Harry Truman, who had become president just a few months before. The sign he gave to the president from that prison contained four words that would become of part of Truman's legacy. The buck stops here. Had that funny yesterday. I'm talking about responsibility. And today we have Harry Truman. The buck stops here. Pretty good. I think it's pretty good. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit for some light moments of pop culture because we have to keep you up to date on what's going on in pop culture world, right? The Cincinnati Auto Expo this weekend, February 16th through 19th. If you like cars, go down to Duke Energy Center this weekend. See, I'm doing my part to probe and promote the economy. Uh, Martha Stewart's dog, I like the name, Genghis. Genghis? Genghis Khan won Best in Breed. The Westminster Dog Show's winner was a, a Pinkanese ugly-ass dog named Malachi. <laughs> Uh, ladies, here's a little, uh, you know, I'm ahead of the curve, ladies. According to a Wall Street Fashion Journal article, the color that's on the way for all of you to embrace is ox blood. I like the color ox blood. Do you know what that is, Jacob? It's kind of an off red. It's kind of a, it's kind of a toned down red. 
Oxblood is the color to be. So if you're out buying some clothes this uh, weekend, Oxblood. Uh, Bill O'Reilly's got a new book coming out. It's called Killing Kennedy. I'm thinking, okay, Killing Lincoln. Kill. I guess Killing Garfield will be next. Uh, but I want you all to remember this name, Martin Dugard. He's the guy that writes. I mean, does anybody believe that Bill O'Reilly writes these books? Nah. He doesn't write a damn word of them, I bet. Martin Dugard, poor guy. Hope he's got a good deal with O'Reilly. Uh, death can be good for sales. I wonder, like, if I died today, if, like, our podcast would increase. Uh, <laughs> back on the charts. Record sales would. 22 of Whitney Houston's tunes landed on the top 200, including I Will Always Love You is number three. 195,000 in sales. Yeah. I Want to Dance with Somebody, 74,000, number 25. I mean, pretty cool. Uh, the Voice, close to unseating the American Idol in ratings. How do you like that? Really? Uh-huh. Wow. The Voice is much better than American Idol. Uh, the Simpson is about rated, The Simpsons is about to join Lassie and Gunsmoke. 500 shows. Wow. Unbelievable. That's impressive. That uh, inc- as long as it takes to make to put animation together, that is impressive. It is takes a long time to put that together. Uh, mixed marriages in the U.S. is an all-time high. Just tells you we're becoming a more diverse society. 8.4%. Woohoo! 8.4. <laughs> it, won't Eight. Be, it won't be all long. That we're, there'll, be no, there'll be no whites, no blacks. We're just going to be all tan. Yeah. <laughs> Just a nice smooth Hispanics. Caramel. Yeah, caramel. We'll be caramel. We'll, and nobody will get sunburned anymore. Yeah. <laughs> See, there's some advantages of mixed mixed marriage. Nobody gets sunburned. Uh, Dancing with Stars. Herman Cain and Michelle Bachman have both turned them down. Really? I don't know why, but they have. Two left feet or so four the, left feet? So that's the pop call. Somebody said that uh, Herman Cain can only dance. I don't know the dancing term, but he can, not eight, but he can do nine or something. That's funny. The nine step. Now let's go to sports. We have some interesting sports news. At least I think it's interesting sports news. Last year, there was only one Division One school, uh, TC, that bragged they didn't have anybody on the roster that had a criminal record. Texas Christian, okay? Well, get this. 17 students were arrested Wednesday including linebacker Tanner Brock, defensive tackle D.J. Lindley, defensive back Devin Johnson, offensive line Ty Horn. They were making sales of marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy, prescription drugs to undercover officers. Six-month investigation. Nailed them. Ron Jaworski has been cut from Monday Night Football. Good. That means more John Gruden. I like Gruden. Jaworski didn't care too much. Tony Gwynn. The San Diego Padre superstar, formerly, had a cancerous tumor removed from his mouth. Prognosis looks good. Your UC Bearcats beat Providence 81-66. Is it me or is the Big East as a whole is down a little? Now, I know Syracuse is ranked second, but it just seems to me that the Big East is down. If you're a Hoosier, congratulations. You beat the big powerhouse Northwestern 71-66. How in the hell did you beat my Wildcats? Uh, NBA. Lynn, 13 assists. Jeremy Lynn, the Harvard educated. By the way, he's the only third kid from Harvard to ever make it to the NBA. Uh, 13 assists. The Knicks, seven straight win as they beat the Kings, 185. And the Pistons defeated the Celtics. The sports. Uh, those of you that are like me and you fight bureaucracy every single damn day, get this. Executives with three managed care companies hired to run most of the state Medicaid program in Kentucky have acknowledged major problems. <laughs> Listen to this. Growing chorus of complaints from health care providers about chronically late payments, bungled claim processing, and constant battles over new rules. Can you imagine the nightmare hospitals and doctors are going through in Kentucky as a result of this crap? Executives with the other companies, the companies were, uh, are uh, Coventry Healthcare Inc., Kentucky Spirit Health Plan, and WellCare of Kentucky. They say they have identified the billing and claims payment problems. All three companies denied they are deliberately withholding payments. Uh, 
Several health care officials testified before the same committee last week that they wonder if the managed care companies are stalling payments to maximize their profits. No! Hmm. No, TC, they wouldn't do that. No, not those guys. They're full of integrity. Of course they are. You, you got that... But let's do the feel good song that we've done pop culture. We've 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 completed pop culture. We've done. Sorry uh, about which, the poor language. Feel good song? Do we decide on Corn- Cornelius yeah. Brothers? Oh, that's Cornelius your, Brothers. I thought, I thought when you went on your rant before, I thought you're wanting the other one. But talk for thirty seconds. I'll All right, I'll talk for you. thirty seconds. And we got to find that bit uh, from the uh, Sergeant Schultz. I got a special place for Sergeant Schultz today. You know, old Hogan's Heroes. I know nothing. <laughs> You know what? You have to admit, how good as a show was Hogan's Heroes that they used a concentration camp and made it funny? I know. Oh, yeah. Oh, now, this is this is for Sensible Don in his absence. Little soul. He's listening in on his Blackberry. Showing my versatility. This is the Cornelius Brothers. This will stick in your head all day. See, I try to think of a song that will stick in your head all day. You like this, don't you, TC? Yeah, I love this song. I love this song. Reminds me of WSAI when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> too bad they were destroyed. You know what it's like out there, don't you guys? It's too late to turn back sometimes. God, it's a good song. Smooth. Yeah, it's a great That's the word that comes to mind. Smooth. I've never done anything like that. No. Drive by our house 20 times. We don't do that kind of stuff, do we? Never. <laughs> we'll play some more now. We'll come back with some more Radio Superbity, and I'm going to tell you a story of a legal battle that I'm in right now. Legal battle on Real Talk 1160. And remember, you can also listen to us live online. Just go to realtalk1160.com and click on Listen Live and use the TuneIn Radio app on your iPhone or Droid. And now, back to the Bulldog. TC, keep that song rolling. Uh, yeah. You know I don't like to brag. But no, I, I've not picked, you. You're I've too cho- modest. I've chosen all my bumper music. And this song, you got to admit, needs more cowbell. <laughs> needs more cowbell i love this song it's about death though isn't it feeling the reaper how can a feel good song be about death yeah. <laughs> now tc yes this is a story that ought to get people revved up and um i mean i just in fact i might play i should play on the air the voicemail that I got from my client. I'll at least Uh-oh. tell you the Are we voice. We allowed to do that. Oh yeah, we're allowed to do that. Okay. Um, I have his permission. I don't. I don't discuss cases on the air without clients' permission. Um, there's a story in the Enquirer today um, about a case that I have, and ladies and gentlemen, the American jury. I am, with all due respect, all my fellow legal brethren. I feel like I'm the best lawyer in the tri-state to handle any type of matter. And the reason being is because I handle every type of legal matter. I told the story about last week I had a domestic trial against a quote-unquote divorce expert. Somebody just does divorces. My God, was I unimpressed. (laughs) I mean, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, can you imagine if you do a complex medical malpractice case, can you imagine how easy a divorce is or a criminal trial is? I can do what they can do. They can't do what I do. At the same time, those people that do just medical malpractice, they don't do civil rights cases or employment cases. And because I do a lot, and I learned this from my dad, I wrote a column about it, actually, and I posted on Facebook yesterday, and it was in the Journal News this week about that. It's it's called cross-training. You know, when you cross-train in a sport, the same applies to law. I am a cross-trained lawyer. Gotcha. But anyway, Stephen Scott is a black man, and um, 
he's and, and I joke that he's as black as Chris Rock. There's that, there's a reason why I say that. It's part of the story here. Um, he's down in Florida and he gets arrested on a warrant for a burglary in Covington. He gets hauled up here. He loses his belongings in his apartment in Florida. He loses his job in Florida. He's held for five months in Kenton County Jail. The eyewitness to the burglary said the burglar was white. Was white. They fingerprint. There was some funny business with this fingerprint that was at the uh, retail shop down in Covington. They held Stephen Scott for five months knowing he was innocent. Think about that. Being in jail five months when the prosecutor, the police officers know you're innocent. They asked him to stipulate the probable cause. Probable cause is what a police officer needs to arrest. You know what probable cause means? Hell, <laughs> I'm a lawyer. Nobody can tell you what it means. It's just like, well, probable cause. You know, like a hint, hunch, whatever. <laughs> probable cause. They said, if you stipulate the probable cause, we'll let you go. Well, they didn't know that he was talking to me, and I said, don't stipulate the probable cause. <laughs> Screw that. If you stipulate the probable cause, you know why, ladies and gentlemen, they want you to stipulate the probable cause so you can't sue their ass. Now, I fought for this guy, all right? And, we've, and, and despite those facts, we lost in district court, in federal district court in Covington, and now we're going to go over to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, I am not going to speak bad of a, a federal judge, okay? I'm not going to get sanctioned. I'm not going to do that. But I practice law on both sides of the river. I have more cases in Ohio than I do Kentucky. And I'm going to tell you right now, it is remarkable if you have the same fact situation in Covington in the same fact situation in Cincinnati, the outcome is completely different. I mean, I, I'm just telling you, it's just, it's, it's just the reality. To win a police misconduct case in the Eastern District of Kentucky is almost impossible. Now, Judge Bunny ruled for us in the famous naked black guy case and he even told the other side they ought to settle because he says when the jury sees this videotape, they're going to be mad. So I win that one, right? Well, they appeal to the Sixth Circuit. I draw a terrible panel, a terrible panel, and we lose. We've now appealed that to the Supreme Court, but back to Stephen Scott. And by the way, when I, those of you out there who give me a bunch of crap about who I am, what I do, or about lawsuits I file, you can go to hell. I won't be in hell. Because let me tell you something, the causes that I fight, and you know what? There's a bunch of chicken crap lawyers out there that they only evaluate cases from a purely monetary situation instead of a righteous cause. Sorry, I feel bad for you if you're uh, Barbara, Barbie shoe cart that your apartment is a wreck. But if your landlord is bankrupt and dead, it's a lost cause. <laughs> I'm allowed as a lawyer to pick my causes. Now I'm going to read the article from the Enquirer. A federal judge has dismissed a lawsuit in which a man claimed two Covington police officers tried to frame him for the burglary of Frank's bin shop five years ago. Covington City Solicitor Frank Warnock applauded the dismissal of Stephen Scott's suit and defended the actions of the police officers, Sergeant Gwendolyn Kelly and Detective Corey Warner. They are good police officers. They are dedicated and conscientious. They did not mean any ill will. Kenton County Commonwealth Attorney Rob Sanders, Assistant Commonwealth Attorney Leanne Beck, the City of Covington, and Crime Technician Don Bayless had previously been dismissed. Scott's attorney Eric Dieter said he was confident the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals would reverse this decision if we, if we draw the right panel of three judges. They quote me, poor Stephen Scott. He was wrongfully arrested and held for five months, Dieter said. 
In April 2007, the Covington Men's Shop was burglarized when someone broke its front window and grabbed $300 worth of merchandise out of a display case. Police officers dusted the store and lifted several prints from the broken window. Before the end of June 2007, the National Fingerprint and Criminal History Database, known as AAFS, possibly, possibly matched one of the prints to Scott. Guess what? It was a print inside the store. Duh! If, you, if you'd shopped there, you'd been inside the store. By December 2009, Scott was released after the trial court dismissed the charges at the prosecutor's request. You know, they kept asking him, we'll drop this if you stipulate the probable cause. He kept saying, no, no, no. They knew they were going to lose. They finally had to drop him. Scott didn't, listen to this, Scott didn't match the description a patron of a nearby bar gave officers at the scene of the burglar. There were also discrepancies about where the matching print was found at the crime scene. Oh, they got a cops. You know, these these cops that didn't mean ill will had a little discrepancy where this print was found. U.S. District Judge William Bertelsman wrote that Scott had, quote, not made a genuine showing, much less a substantial one, that officers Warner's or Detective Kelly's conduct was reckless or deliberate. With all due respect to Judge Bertelsman, he is wrong. Bertelsman's words were not all kind to the officers. Now get this. After ruling against us, he says this. At best, their investigation and documentation can be characterized as sloppy or negligent. Adding, if they had just reviewed the crime scene reports, they would have recognized the discrepancy. Oh, police officers don't have to do that. Bertelsman concluded, however, that despite the discrepancy or where the fingerprint was found, its existence provided police with objective physical evidence. Scott. Now, here's the question, ladies and gentlemen of the American jury. Once police and prosecutors know you're innocent... They're allowed to just keep holding you? Now let's forget about the probable cause to arrest. Once they know, because that's what this case is all about. Once they know, they're allowed to keep holding you? Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, if you ever uh, need a lawyer that gives a damn, call me. Eric Dieters on Real Talk 1160. Eric Dieters, the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Uh, Note to radio station, we do have to fix these. Dennis Miller is not on at noon. Correct. He is Michael on at Savage at noon. And there was also Savage. a promo earlier that said that Dave Ramsey was on. So What? Yes, seriously. We got to get those cleaned up. Uh, by the way, I, I need to uh, do a couple little rants here with the risk of making everybody mad. Chuck hates when I do this. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't understand all of you who believe that someone owes you something. I'm talking about those who work for a company or the government, and it's all about that pension, pension. I grew up on a farm. Farmers don't get pension. I work for myself. I don't get a pension. I think everybody should work till you die. Sorry to offend anybody. Now, I thought of this. Uh, I mean, I, I was, like, enlightened. I mean, lately, the last few days, I've been inspired, T.C., and everybody looks for solutions for our country. And, you know, just like usually, you can find solutions in something simple. Something simple. And I decided that one way for a great, to become a great country or to keep a great country is two things. Greatness and honor. We must have hardworking, honorable men and women. Everything else falls into place. John Wennett wanted to play Imagine. Let's imagine this. Just imagine this, okay? I can play that... Uh, Matthew McConaughey, <laughs> close your eyes. Not if you're driving, but imagine this. Every teacher, every worker, every employer, every student, every public official is hardworking and honorable. What do you mean? That means every teacher gives a damn, does the right thing. Every worker cares about what they're doing, about the work that they're doing. Honest. Every employer cares about the product that they're turning out. Every student cares about his grades, cares about, you know, being a good student. Every public official genuinely cares 
about the public trust. <laughs> Doesn't everything else fall into place? <laughs> what do we have now? We have a bunch of dishonor. <laughs> we got more lazy than work, more apathy than care. We don't need perfect folks. We don't need saints. We just need hardworking, honorable members of society. There's your solution. All problems. Honorable, hardworking members. Agree, TC? I think that would help. You and I aren't perfect, but we're hardworking, honorable members of society. If everybody was like us, all the problems would be solved. I think that's a, that's a step in the right direction. Now, do you have that Hogan's Heroes bit for me? That I, I know for? nothing. I have nothing. If not, if not, you can just imitate him. Because I can't use the B word on the radio, I'm going to use the W word. Debbie Wasserman Schultz is a winch. I can't wait to hear her blathering crap defend the submitted president of Obama. So to honor Debbie Wasserman Schultz, we have a little, you know what? Sergeant Schultz is her new nickname. Sergeant Schultz. It's not great. Her last, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Good old Sergeant Schultz. I know nothing. <laughs> He's so Schultz funny. was great, wasn't he? Schultz was great. The way the way old Hogan could manipulate him, him and Colonel Clink, and, and and just a little strudel, you know, yeah, just, a, just little, a little strudel. Just a little for strudel. This. Mm. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> there's a great article in the Wall Street Journal today. Daniel Henninger wrote, writes about how Clint Eastwood is no Obama. No kidding. Listen to this. The Obama budget is about national attitude. Before this presidency, the national attitude attitude was indeed caught in the snarling, disgusted, refused to lose tone of Clint Eastwood's voice in that commercial. The new national attitude and offer is caught in the Obama voice. Resentful, moody, looking for someone else to blame and then punish. An American wealth tax will make us wimpy and windy. That won't be halftime. It will be the final whistle. Oh, oh. Daniel Henniger nails it. And everyone's getting on poor Clint. You know, we still love Clint. Clint's I mean, great. And by the way, I supported that commercial. I, there was too. nothing wrong with that commercial. No, that no. commercial was about an industry. It was about America. And they're all trying to pull. I don't give a damn if two Obamaites produced a commercial. It didn't say, vote for Obama. Mm, that no, was no. a pro-American, pro-auto industry, pro-Detroit commercial. They're trying to sell cars. I mean, they've got enough problems. Why would they try to you know, and fix by the his way, image? And, their own issue. And by the way, Clint Eastwood said as much. He yeah. says, hey, you know what? If somebody wants to adopt that, run with it. But I'm not an Obama person. I say next person that criticizes that commercial will give him a right turn, Clyde. There you go. The you old know? right turn, Clyde. I like that. <laughs> Good pickup. Those of you that don't know what we're talking about, go watch that series any which way you can. Every which way you can. Was yeah. there a third any one? Any which way but lose. Any which way. But- Eddie, didn't Eddie Rabbit sing the song in yeah. one of those? I think. Yeah. By the way, how cool is it that Clint Eastwood, just think about Clint Eastwood. He had a whole line of movies, The Man With No Name. Yeah. He had the whole line of series with Dirty Harry. Right. He had the whole line of any which way you can. Yeah. I mean, this guy... <laughs> And then he decides, ah, I want to be a director. want to be a director. And if you haven't seen Gran Torino Classic, you know what? They make fun, politically incorrect, of every, you know, him showing him a bigot. Every possible bigotry possibility there was. Really? Have you seen Gran Torino? No, I've not oh, seen it. Oh, it's great. They, he doesn't use the N-word. Okay. But he uses a word similar to that. But he, he shows himself to be a bigot. Every, I mean, Asians, Hispanics, Blacks. But this is what's so great about it. This is the brilliance of that movie. But it turns out, despite all that attitude that he has, when he got right down to it, he was a good, great guy, and he does the right thing. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Behind you know, I, that stone facade. I always, I always like the Bible story that talks about the uh, two sons. That the uh, man said, "Okay, sons, you know you got to go out and work the fields." And and the one son, I don't want to go around. But then he went out and worked the fields. Yeah. The other son said, "Sure," and didn't go work out the fields. And of course, it's the parable: who did the right thing? Well, the bitchin' soldier did the right thing. 
the happy soldier that didn't go do his job did the wrong. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. I love that story because I'm kind of like that. I'm kind of, but I always do it. <laughs> ah, dang, I can't stay. Because oh. you did it because you didn't, even though you didn't want to do it. Correct. Uh, Barack Obama's Wall Street Journal article today, uh, offended by President Obama's decision to force health insurers to pay for contraception and surgical sterilization, question mark, it gets worse. In the future, thanks to Obamacare, the government will issue such health edicts on a routine basis and largely insulated from public view. This goes beyond contraception to cancer screenings, like the use of common drugs like aspirin and much more. Under Obamacare, a single committee, the United States Preventative Services Task Force, is empowered to evaluate preventative health services and decide which will be covered by health insurance plans. Ladies and gentlemen of the American jury, that is freaking communists and you don't think that we should arm march on washington now (laughs) the united states preventative services task force this is the task force already rates services with letter grades of a through d or i if insufficient jeez oh baby by the way, I'm with the risk of uh, upsetting the United States Supreme Court, which is considering my naked black man case on Friday in committee. Oh, please take the case. Please take the case. You know, <laughs> the United States Supreme Court should have taken this Obamacare thing like right away. I mean, come on. They have the right to do it, the power to do it. They should have just grabbed it and said, bring it on up. There was nothing to be gained by letting it go through the circuits and letting all these inconsistent decisions work themselves out. Not good. Uh, On the economic front, we got some big news here. Uh, Kellogg's buying Pringles from Procter & Gamble for only $27 billion. Holy cow. Pringles is, by the way. I have a question about Pringles for you. Is that a potato chip made with potatoes or is it some artificial processed food? Whatever, thing. whatever it is, it tastes good. And I tell you right now, I love, I love Pringles. Do you? I think it's artificial because they make them too perfect. Well, you know, there was a big ordeal about that in Great Britain because if if they're made actually with real potatoes, there's a greater tax that they've got to pay, like a food tax. The manufacturers do, so they're trying to prove that no, they're not really oh, potatoes. <laughs> how about how about the latest where they want a world uh, uh, international tax? How, how about this though? I think it's a smart move by Kellogg's because I think when somebody gets into something that's not related, for example, those of you who think I'm crazy, all the things that I do, bulldoggy, I do that because it ties into law practice. Okay. I mean, I'm just telling you. I mean, when, when the more the more the bulldog's image goes up, the more legal business I get. Right. Well, Pringles is in the cereal business. I think the, the snack. I mean, Kellogg's. I think the snack business is a perfect extension of the cereal business. I think it. I yeah. think it's a smart move. Right. Yeah, I think so. Uh, we have some more economic news we're going to discuss when we come back. Got a little bit of world news. Got some more politics. Do you want to be a revolution? On Real Talk 1160. Hey, remember the other guys. Sports Show has their own Facebook page filled with articles, videos, some questions, and a whole lot more. Just go to Facebook.com slash other guys on Real Talk 1160 or find them online at realtalk1160.com. And now back to the Bulldog. Eric Dieter's the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. GM is going to freeze the U.S. pension plan for longtime white-collar workers. It's about time. Uh, the, the market has slumped. You know this grease thing, up, down, up, down every day. It's kind of, what a joke. Uh, people are worried about oil going $10 a gallon based upon our rent. Hey, the prince of Saudi Arabia said he would not let oil go over $100. Well, it went over... $102. Come on, Prince. Wow. Start letting that oil go. Uh, CBS profits up 31%. Comcast profits up 26%. Uh, how, how, how hilarious is this? Barack Obama hosts the Chinese vice president, president-to-be. And on the same day, I think he finishes up, uh, China reduces their holdings in our U.S. treasuries. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, also in the world, a joke in Afghanistan. So much for a win. According to Wall Street Journal, Karzai the official Afghanistan government, U.S. and Taliban, are in secret talks for peace. What a joke. (laughs) What a joke. When we leave Afghanistan, chaos, chaos, chaos. Iran, I'm tired of all the crap. Drop the bomb. Get her done. That's what I say. I mean, come on. Are you kidding me? It's... (laughs) 
It's already it's already a nightmare over there. Already a nightmare. Don't you agree, TC? I do agree. I do agree. We should have made that the United States desert years ago. Uh, turning to the, and this is, I think is pretty interesting, turning to the GOP uh, race. <laughs> Very interesting. According to Rasmussen poll, I think Santorum is up 12 points nationally on Romney. He's even up on him in Michigan, which is quote-unquote that home state. And now all of these supporters of Romney, like Coulter and Krautheimer and all of them, are turning on Romney a little bit, saying he's just not carrying the water the way he should. Uh, Santorum's doing a great preemptive commercial in Michigan. Basically has a guy that looks like Romney running through a warehouse shooting an automatic oh, weapon. Rombo. Rombo shooting an automatic <laughs> weapon. That's all he's capable of. And you know what? It's the truth. That's what he did to Newt. That's what he's got to do. But here's the problem with Santorum. All he's got is Santorum voted for spending. You know, well, yeah. they all, he hate to say this, but the great defense is, yeah, so did everybody else. It's not the same as what he had on Newt. I mean, right. Newt did the cap and trade commercial with uh, his uh, his nemesis Pelosi. You know, Newt had the personal problems. I mean, you had plenty of info on Newt, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, right, right. Santorum. I don't think they got anything on the guy. That's the guy doing his job. I mean, so I tell you right now, the Romney campaign's in trouble again. Well, did you hear uh, Santorum got a big endorsement from um, uh, one of the guys from Megadeth? Yeah, right. That's right. Right. You know, right. He says the country's in trouble. We got to do something. I like, it. and he says he liked because uh, when the guy uh, he he stepped down, remember had to deal with his uh, with his daughter had the situation health issue. Oh yeah. And then he said, you know, he looked at this guy again and he said, I really like this guy. You know, you know the thing about Santorum too, TC, is this: unlike Newt, he doesn't have all those personal issues. Right. Married right. man. No, apparently, uh, skeletons in the closet. Yeah. Has a, a child with special issues that he takes care of. Uh, you know, good guy, good conservative. You know, stays true to his beliefs on this, those. Unlike Romney, who's been all over the place, like on abortion, you know, right. Santorum's been st- solid there, like Ron Paul. And he's emerging to be like the most stable. Republican candidate. Correct. And how about and how about Newt? Newt's calling for Santorum to get the hell out of the race before <laughs> because it was just blocking. Well, okay, Newt, the same logic that you applied to Santorum applies to you. Get the hell out of the race. Yeah, three's company, Newt. You're three, right. Three's, three's, three's company. Three's, three's, three's company. Three's now, now all the Ron Paul people are going to come yell at us. What about yeah. Ron Paul? Well, let's face it. I like Ron Paul's, a lot of his policies – but Ron Paul can't win. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's a time to stand just on principle. But by the way, Santorum has got just as much principle, and I think, as Ron Paul. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he, he has been a principled dude. Now, I want to say this. I'm sorry, but I want to win, win, win. Ron Paul's not going to get the GOP nomination, and Ron Paul is not going to be Barack Obama. Santorum can't, and I don't care what they say. There's, they fear Romney. No, they don't feel Romney. He's exhibit A to the one percenters. Multi-millionaire. You know, and oh, I got to say, my dad, and those, those this, is, this was kind of very painful to me. When I left the old law firm, Dieters, Benzer, and Lavelle, went out on my own, it had nothing to do with my dad at all. Nothing. And I had to put up with all these rooms. His own dad kicked him out of his law, which is total crap. My dad thought it was a good move for me to leave the law firm and go out on my own. And my dad and I are very close, and he's a very big supporter. Always has been, always will be. And uh, my dad doesn't understand my practice. It's kind of funny because he represented big institutions that you submit the bills, you get paid. You know, I take all the – although my dad's in the horse business, and I always say, Pops, just consider what I do as a contingency lawyer like you in the horse business. There's a thousand ways to win and a thousand ways to lose a horse race. That's what I do. But he marvels at the volume of paper that I generate when I work these cases. But anyway, my dad is not a Boy Scout, to use my dad's expression. And I used to I used to sit in his office and listen to him talk to clients, talk to people. It was kind of cool to sit there in your dad's office and listen to him talk to the bishop or the head of a bank or a governor, and you kind of just you know see the interaction. You learn a lot. And uh, my dad always – now, my dad is an honorable man, but he also used this expression that he said he couldn't stand dealing with a Boy Scout. 
Now, what he meant by that was, is these people that are so self-righteous, so, you know, they, they follow every single rule to the T, that they're Boy Scouts. And there isn't anything more frustrating than dealing with a Boy Scout. I'm telling you, there isn't. Uh, it's great training, don't get me wrong. I'm not bashing the Boy Scouts. God bless the Boy Scouts. But when you get in the real world out there, guess what? Uh, being a Boy Scout doesn't work. Now you say, dog, why are you giving us this a big Boy Scout rendition? Because it applies to Mitt Romney. Doesn't Mitt Romney come off like a Boy Scout to you? It's like he's afraid to say anything, make anybody mad. He's afraid to do anything that possibly could be wrong. Ooh, I can't talk about those super PACs. You know I could get in trouble. I mean, a Boy Scouts will drive you bonkers. Dick Roding, who I supported for state senate, was a Boy Scout. Would drive you nuts. Now, old Rick Santorum, he's a principled man too, but you can tell he ain't a Boy Scout. He ain't afraid to throw a punch. Okay, Mitt Romney, when he does throw a punch, it's awkward because it's a punch being thrown by a Boy Scout. He comes off wimpy. Like when he says, well, you know, I'm not going to I'm not gonna stand down, and if, if I get hit, i got to hit back. It just sounds so, eh. It's like he goes, take that. Ooh, yeah, did yeah, it hurt you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I'll be honest with you. He comes off sounding very sissified. Did it hurt you? Yeah, Romney, Romney is a sissy. Let's call it the way it is. <laughs> Mitt Romney's a sissy. You could even use other words if you're doing what I'm talking about. Buddy, I'm going to be kind. He's a sissy. And sissies don't play well. They just don't. That's the problem with there. I have summed it all up for all of you political pundits if you want to know why Romney is where he, where he is and he can't get traction. Because he's a sissy. Americans don't like sissies. Americans like John Waynes. They like a man's man and a woman's man. I'm serious. Don't you? I mean, isn't that why men and women both like Mel Gibson? Men and women both like Russell Crowe? And Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan. I mean, it, isn't that true? I mean, it's kind of like it's a man's man and a woman's man. I'm sorry, but ladies still like you when you open their door. Women still like flowers. Women still like you to be a gentleman around them. I'm telling you. It's what it, that's the problem with Romney. Romney is a big old sis because those same women that want you to open the door and give them flowers don't want you to be a wimp. There is nothing that's going to turn a woman off more than when another man runs over you. I mean, if I was married, if I was a woman married to a guy, and I and that my husband would let people walk all over him, I'd be like, take your purse off, take off your skirt, grow a pair. Are you kidding me? I'm being serious. What's attractive about a man who's a wimp, who is a sissy, who lets somebody runs all over him? I think women like to be with that strong man. I know my wife does. My wife tells me all the time, you know, she feels safe and secure with me. Not just from the physical standpoint, just generally standpoint. When there's a problem in the household, I solve it. I don't let anybody run over me. That's a problem. <laughs> you know what? You know what? Rick Santorum ought to run a commercial that says, he ought to look straight at camera, hey, do you want a guy from a tough Pennsylvania steel town or do you want a sissy? <laughs> <laughs> do you want a tough That's a guy? campaign ad. Is that not a great campaign ad? Just say, Mitt Romney, <laughs> a sissy. <laughs> That's great, man. I have I have got the right campaign. You can, you can put that in a 30-second commercial however you want. But Rick, if you're listening to me, he's coming to Warren County and Brown County. If you're a, if you're in the club car, the Santorum campaign, just say Mitt Romney's a sissy on Real Talk 1160. <laughs> Eric Dieters, the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Give me some water, some good green water down on the me- hey, maybe that's how we can uh, keep the. Hispanics and terrorists from Europe, they're coming, Middle East coming over. Let's build a moat like Herman Cain wanted, a moat of green water. I like that idea. A green boy, we could sell them the green water for the moat. <laughs> that we wouldn't have to pay back that uh, million dollars. You know, one of the Bulldog Nation members, Bill, pointed out that I shouldn't say Boy Scout that the word sissy is better because I don't offend anybody. I wanted to stress, I like the Boy Scouts. It's just that when you get in the real world, you can't be a Boy Scout. You got to, <laughs> life's rough around the edges, but 
I like the idea of sissy. Now, the reason why they ought to stick that word to Romney, sissy, 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 is because look how damaging that was, that image. He had to fight it to George Bush 1. They called him a wimp. They used the word wimp, which was really unfair. The guy was a teenager fighting World War II, getting shot down down twice. George Bush was not a wimp. Not at all. But he had to fight the label. Well, Romney, sissy, 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 sissy. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I'm serious. That's his problem. Uh, You know, because it's kind of like somebody throws a punch and somebody throws a slap. Yeah. Romney's a slapper. Yeah. He's not a puncher. You know, this is this will be this is gonna be a ride if Santorum wins because I looked at Santorum from the get go and he just seemed like a lightweight to me. And remember those debates, T C when there was nine of them on the stage? Yeah. And they always stuck Kane, the, the the alpha dogs. They already always stuck Kane and Perry and uh, Romney in the middle and they had Ron Paul on one end. Look, listen to me. And they had Santorum on the other end saying, I'd like to speak. I'd like to speak. <laughs> right. I mean, they ignored the guy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there were debates where he was completely ignored. <laughs> now but he kept he, fighting. Now he might be the – I mean, it's remarkable. Well, you know, you, you, you uh, make a good point, though, about the, the whole sissy thing, seriously, because look at uh, uh, Newt Gingrich. I mean, he comes across – I don't want to say like as a bully, but he's a tough yes. guy. Newt he's Gingrich a is a strong, tough guy. You know, he's a you – know, Tough he's like, guy, right. Okay, that's the kind of guy you want as a leader, okay, in right. that category. Right. Uh, again, same thing with Herman Cain. Right. Um, even with Rick Perry. Even with Rick you know, Perry, yep. That they had that that leadership quality, that right. strong. Strong man. You know, yeah, strong man. Yeah, that persona or whatever. And, and, and you see, I think the difference is like when people say, well, yeah, he ran he ran Bain Capital. But come on, that's a Wall Street thing. They, yeah. you, who looks at Wall Street? Well, that's a manly man thing. No. That's not the same as running a pizza company. Right. Seriously, it's not You're the same right. as being governor of Texas, you know, yeah. or Newt Gingrich, you know, being Mr. Historian, writing those books about George Washington and so forth and so on. So uh, anyway, I tell you right now, he is a sissy. By the way, I, Chuck Holbrook wants me to give uh, Jason Harper an oracle, and I'm going to go ahead and give Jason Harper an oracle. And you're wondering what, what Jason Harper did. This is this is great. Jason Harper did this. Uh Jason Harper, a senior at Grand Junction High School, walked out of choir practice. The class was singing a song praising Allah. <laughs> really? Good golly. What? You know, there was a, there is a promo on our radio station that discusses, you know, why do we have to fall over backwards for everybody else's sensitivity as opposed to being Americans? Mm-hmm. And I want to continue this theme that I have about, you know, we had we dis- we have discussed uh, Clint Eastwood, we have discussed an armed march on Washington. We've discussed that Mitt Romney is a sissy, sissy, sissy. And, uh, you know, a man's man, a woman's man. And, and going back to what I'm talking about, we need great men and women again. For example, when I talked about doing the right thing, TC, that it cures all ills, isn't it true that having a good man head a household in every household in America – and we used to have that much more often in the 50s and whatnot. Would that not be better for America? Yeah. I mean, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not picking on them, but you know this. In the, in the black community, in the inner cities of this country, it's a known issue that there's a lot of no man is present in the household. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, it becomes an issue. You got street violence because you don't have a man grabbing that teenage boy and saying, hey, buddy. Get your, get your guidance, yeah. that leadership. And by the way, it's not just a black community. It's every community. You know, we have the breakdown of the family in the white suburban community. And you need a good, strong man to set people straight. I'm, I'm going to tell you something very interesting and very personal. I like sharing this stuff with you to connect. My first wife died of cancer. Okay, the mother of my three children. And when she's sitting there dying of cancer, you know what she says? Thank God it's me and not you. I'm like, don't say that. Come on, these kids need their mom. And nobody wants to fight for life more than a mother. I can tell you right now, you take, you take any, whether it's a human or an animal, that wants to fight for life more than as a mother. Moms have that maternal instinct. They fight. And I know she fought to live for the kids. 
Okay? Now, she said, I said, well, why do you say that? She goes, come on. Not only are you the breadwinner, but when these kids are, are teenagers and they're growing up, they're going to need a strong head of household like you. And by the way, I know personally single moms who have raised kids, and I'm telling you, there's some hellions on wheels. Now, don't get me wrong. You could have a dad in a household and still have a hellion. It's called genetics. But my point is, is that it makes a difference. We need strong men, not sissies, in society. Just like we need good women in society. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need some bar-hopping crazy women in society. Well, I wouldn't go that uh, far. TC, I got to ask we, you. We, we need a few of them. No, no, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dog. I'm going to dog something that a lot of women do okay mm -hmm. and i don't get it and, and when i hear the phrase i cringe i just cringe girls night out mm. now don't get me wrong guys need to go do their thing and women go do thing but i hate that phrase girls night out what does that mean okay girls go out to a bar and get drunk and get hit on by guys i mean come on what else is it? I don't know. A lot of times when girls are having their girls not out, they don't want guys around. I know relationships and marriages that have been destroyed by girls night out. Here's how it goes. <laughs> they go out every Thursday night, every Thursday night with the girls. They go out. They go out to the bars. They come home 2 o'clock in the morning. And then they, next thing you know, they want two nights out. I'm telling you, that's what happened to my my oldest brother's first marriage. It all started with the good old Thursday night out with the girls at work. I'm telling you. So anyway, by the way, not to pick on you ladies, same thing with the guys. Guys that have to go out with the guys all the time, I don't get that either. If you're married, you should be at home at night. Just watch what I'm saying. That's what I think. It doesn't mean you don't go to the, the game with your buddy. It doesn't mean you don't have your, your isolated moments. But people that do that all the time, I don't get. See, now you understand what Bulldog Nation's all about. Working hard. Working till you die. Speaking of strong men, how much time do I got till a break? All right, I'm, I'm going to read this. Uh, been looking for the right time to, to read this, and now's a Don Tamal, I'll talk to Don. Don, you're on Real Talk 1160. Say something witty or wise. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing uh, great. I was just listening to you just thinking, you know, you're wrong. I'm sorry, bud. I have to tell you, I have to call you out when you're wrong. You're wrong. I you, mean, you can you call me I'm wrong. Like, you can, you're, you allowed know, to, I, you're allowed to call me wrong. What am I wrong about? Well, you, you know I just lost my wife to ovarian cancer over the summer. You and I talked about this before. Did you hear the beginning of my show? Yes, I did. Well, well, there was nothing wrong about that, was it? Cancer sucks. Yes, trust me, I know. All right, go ahead, go ahead. You're saying that, you know, these kids that need their strong friends, they need both. That's what the hell is the problem with the country now. Well, I agree with you, John. I don't parents. disagree with you. I agree with you that you need, they need both. I was using that, John, as an, or Don, as an example that how much a, it's important for a man. But I agree with you 100%. Our families need a woman and a man. Go ahead. I mean, the family, nobody sits together at the table anymore. Nobody knows what's going on in schools. True. I mean, the problem with this country is everybody's individualized. Nobody is sticking together the family unit. Nobody's taking care of each other. Good point. I mean, your friends are supposed to be your family you get to choose. And you need to take care of them just like your blood family. And that's the problem. No one's doing that. Everything's individualized. What's for me? What's for me? I mean, that's a good, you need a father. You need that's a good point. It's a good My point. My daughter every night wants to have wants a new mommy. You know, she just turned five yesterday. You know, she just lost her over the summer. I, I can take her. I do her hair, do the bows. You know, I do her nails, whatever she wants to do. But I'm still not well, a female figure. Well, let me. I can. I can uh, help explain this. First of all, I was using that as a point to how much they need a man. They do need women. Let me give you an example with me. I remarried, okay, Don? I remarried yep. after a year, and yep. I wanted my kids to have a woman. I'm going to tell you something. Thank God that I've had a woman in the household to deal with the uh, the, the first menstrual cycle, uh, dating boys. Right now, I have a daughter that is going to get married. And thank God I got a woman to go out there and help pick out a wedding dress and do all that stuff. You're right. Daughters need a mother to talk to. Don, you need to go get remarried, buddy. <laughs> one of these days, brother. One of these days. God bless you, man. You too, my friend. See you.
Michael Savage did. He's guilty. You can catch Michael Savage noon today on Real Talk 1160. Now back to the Bulldog. Eric Dieter's the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Just want to leave you with my Boondock Saints motto of life. You know, one of the things that uh, Laura Ingram went on a uh, little bit of a rampage, a little bit. I wouldn't rampage too strong of a word, but uh, she discussed this a long time. Again, Coulter might have too a little bit, and I agree with him. Is this? How about all of these uh, politicians that appear to have a lot of support behind them that chose not to run for office? And when you think about it, okay, like Mitch Daniels, who everybody considered be a great candidate, did a great job the other Saturday after the, or after the State of the Union speech that evening where he gave the response and he was praised for it. And uh, he didn't run. And he didn't run because apparently his wife and his daughter said he didn't want him to run. Well, did George Washington say, hey, Martha, What should I do here? Did Abraham Lincoln? I mean, are you kidding me? Now, don't get me wrong. you got to factor in the whole family picture. But Chris Christie, why didn't he run? You know? Let's make fun of Chris Christie and Mitch Daniels and all of these solid presidential timber candidates that were too chicken to run. (laughs) Think about it. The guys that are running out there are doers. You know, Rick Santorum, I didn't think he had a snowball's chance. He might be president. He's a doer. Got to give it up to him. They go out there and swing. You know, Babe Ruth hit 714 home runs. He struck out over 2,000 times. Hey, he struck out over 2,000 times. And remember the great Teddy Roosevelt speech? The, 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 I mean, about it's the people in the arena. You know, it's not the people that are sitting on the sidelines, the critics that don't try to do anything to change anything. It's the man in the arena with blood, sweat, and tears that knows that terrible feeling of loss, but also the great joy of victory. I've had some great victories in my life and great defeats in my life. And two things I can tell you. One, the defeats, you can leave them behind and go on to the next battle. And the victories, it's just a pause. Because the victory's over quick, too. All glory is fleeting. You win a case. You do something great. It's a pause. It's like you go out and you have that beer to celebrate, and then you go home, and it's like, okay, what's next? You don't, quote, unquote, rest on your laurels. You don't do that. It's not what you do it at all. How you do it at all. Uh, my mom and dad uh, celebrated their 50th. Uh, this was this was a teaching lesson for me. Speaking of families and how you need a mom and a dad in a, in a home. Uh, my mom and dad celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary, I think it was. 55th, 60th. It's way up there, okay? And I found this remarkable. My mom and dad, they don't like a lot of attention. And we had their party. We had a, we had a mass at St. Cecilia, then... Downstairs, I was on a Saturday night. We had a little party. You know, the only people they wanted there, all the kids, all the grandkids, and a few friends. I'm talking about a few friends. Okay, Ray Hardebeck and his wife were there. The Hoffmans were there. These are people that are their friends from church. I think that was it. My mom's good friend, Charlotte Nolan, drove up from Harlan County. And my mom and dad are now 82 years old. And this was just a couple years ago. Uh, everybody brought in their quilts. My mom makes a quilt for every one of the grandkids. By the way, just to let you know, my family's not perfect. There's plenty of dynamics going. On. I mean, we, at least we could all sit in the same room as uh, siblings, but it doesn't mean there's always peace and harmony in our big old family, okay? I don't want to give you the wrong picture. But still, everybody gathers together and gets along. There's no fistfights at our family gatherings. But anyway, Charlotte Nolan was asked to speak for my mother. And I was honored that my brothers and sisters asked me to say something about my dad. Now I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my God, i got to stand up in front of the family and say something about my dad who's 82 years old and think, oh, my God, what do you say? Pretty emotional kind of thing, too. You know, you're speaking about your dad. 
But there's the epitome of family. My mom and dad raising 11 kids, all these grandkids. Every one of us have stayed out of jail, all 11 of us, believe it or not. Uh, all 11 of us are working members of society. They've done pretty good, I think. All got a good education, thanks to my dad. My dad's 82 years old, and he still works on the farm. He's still involved in the – he still runs the Dieter's company. And, he's just, and he, he has no plans to uh, give up his control. He has no plans to quit any day soon. All right? Now, yet this will help you. Now, I'm sitting there thinking, what do I say about my dad? And then I found it. Now, I'm saying this not just to share with you what I share with my dad. I'm sharing this for you because the theme that we accidentally fell upon today – was the world needs more man, men's men. Oliver Wendell Holmes was appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States, and he was known as the great dissenter, my kind of guy. He wrote written dissents all the time. Another thing that Oliver Wendell Holmes was famous for, he fought in the Civil War and was shot and almost died twice. Think about that. Oliver Wendell Holmes served in the Civil War, shot a couple times, almost died, becomes a great lawyer in Boston, becomes a member of the Supreme Court. <laughs> CBS radio broadcast, Oliver Wendell Holmes' 90th birthday, March 8th, 1931. He's asked to deliver a national broadcast on his 90th birthday. He's still on the Supreme Court when this is going on at 90. He didn't quit at 40 after a 20-year pension at his local county uh, job. Sorry, folks. Those of you that do that, you need to keep working until you die. This is what he said. This is all he said. In this symposium, and this is what I read at my dad's birthday, because he likes horses, or his anniversary. In this symposium, my part is only to sit in silence. To express one's feelings as the end draws near is too intimate a task. But I may mention one thought that occurs to me as a listener in. The riders in the race do not stop short when they reach the goal. There is a little finishing canter before coming to a standstill. There is time to hear the kind voices of friends and to say to oneself, the work is done. But just as one says that, the answer comes. The race is over, but the work is never done while the power to work remains. The canter that brings you to a standstill need not be only coming to rest, it cannot be while you still live, for to live is to function. That is all there is in living. And so I end with a line from a Latin poet who uttered the message more than 1,500 years ago. Death plucks my ear and says, live, I am coming. Is that awesome? Intense. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Let me tell you something, folks. Death's coming to all of us. Coming to me, coming to you, coming to everybody. I started out the show honoring somebody I never knew. Robin Stevenson, 42, dying of cancer. God love her. You think she planned on that? So while we're here on earth, we should be living. And you hear what Oliver Wendell Holmes says? Working. America became great through hard work. And honorable leaders, great leaders, great men, great women. That's, that's, the, that's the key to solving our problems. Not the America that Barack Obama wants to have us wear. Hey, you got any problem? Jump in the wagon, baby. There's people that are going to help you and pull that wagon for you. Oh, what do you got? Oh, you're bipolar? Oh, I'll jump in that wagon. We'll take care of you. Oh, oh your, your toes hurt? Get in that wagon. Oh, you're, you're unemployed? Oh, well, you can stay unemployed forever. Jump in that wagon. Armed revolution, baby. That's what we need. Scare the hell out of them. Every dog has their day. I hope today and tomorrow is yours. I'll be back tomorrow with some real radio superbity. By the way, I forgot to say it. John Bick, Rupke Automotive, Rupke Automotive, Rupke Automotive on Real Talk 1160.